immortalized as the most exclusive club, and it's by invitation only. You can't buy a membership, you can't use political influence, you can't cheat your way into it. Everybody wants in. Presidents, kings, celebrities, political leaders create effigies and build monuments just to be immortalized. Dictators create a culture that's nothing short of idol worship. Children sing their praises every single day. All of this in an effort to be remembered. Think of what Muawiyah did. He tried every trick in the book, yet nothing remains of him in his own capital city. The only significant ancient structure that remains erect in Damascus is the shrine of Hussein's three-year-old orphan. What this means is to become immortal, one has to pass crucial divine tests. To learn more on how we can gain access to the ultimate privilege, we explore the lives of a number of companions, ordinary people who became extraordinary. Looking for clues as to what turned them into the invincible forces of nature that shaped history despite being persecuted and in many cases murdered. Individuals who carved their names in the annals of history as giants of devotion, faith, and sacrifice. Many are obscure to the average viewer, but that will be no more. These are their stories. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One of the greatest lessons of عاشوراء is that immortality is within our grasp if and only if we align our lives, our actions, our thoughts, our beliefs with the same values espoused by Imam al Hussein on the plains of Karbala. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse in Surah As Saf. The Almighty Allah says in verse number 14, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. كونوا أنصار الله كما قال عيسى بن مريم للحواريين من أنصاري إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله فآمنت طائفة من بني إسرائيل وكفر الطائفة فأيدنا الذين آمنوا على عدوهم فأصبحوا ظاهرين In this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us to be among those who are helpers in the cause of Allah. And God then quotes Jesus, the son of Mary, as saying to who? To his disciples. He says to them, Man ansari ilallah. Who are my helpers in the cause of Allah? The disciples, God tells us, responded to Jesus, we are Allah's helpers. We are here to help you and to support you. Then God says, a group of the children of Israel believed and a group disbelieved. Therefore, we provided those who believed assistance against their enemies and they became triumphant. And this, brothers and sisters, is the very essence of what we're talking about in this series. Those who were triumphant, those who became immortal, they did so because they stood, they took a stance in support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
when they were called to do so. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about an incredibly important companion of the Holy Messenger of God. Someone who was extremely consequential and played a pivotal role in the aftermath of the death of the Holy Prophet of Islam. And in fact, turned into a symbol for the belief that was carried by the supporters of the commander of the faithful and exposed the sheer hypocrisy of his enemies. Let me start off with a tradition that contextualizes all of this and allows you to appreciate just how significant this particular companion was despite the fact that many of you have probably never even heard of him. In a hadith, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kazim alayhi salam is quoted to have said, and this is mentioned in Rijal al-Kashi and elsewhere, the Imam says that on the day of judgment, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُنَادِ مُنَادٍ A caller is heard. A proclamation, an announcement is made. What is this announcement on the day of judgment? أَيْنَ حَوَارِيُّ Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where are the disciples of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Many of you are familiar with the disciples of Jesus. And we mentioned the verse in which Allah speaks of them. But who are the disciples of Ali? Who are those within the inner circle of Ali? Who were those who were trained by Ali? Aina Hawari Ali ibn Abi Talib. وَصِيِّ Muhammad ibn Abdullah, رَسُولِ اللَّهِ فَيَقُومْ A group of people rise on the Day of Judgment who are identified as the disciples of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The first person to rise according to this hadith is a man by the name of Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i. And he is at the center of our story and our tale and our discussion tonight. Who was Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i? Why was he so important? And why have you not heard much about him? Are questions that hopefully will be answered as we progress through this discussion. Amr ibn al-Hamiq, you should know a few things about him. Number one, he was among the companions of the Holy Messenger of God. He entered Islam later on, perhaps after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which means that he didn't witness the monumental battles of the Holy Prophet like Badr, Uhud, Khaybar, and Khandaq, also known as Al-Ahzab. He didn't witness those battles, he joined the prophetic mission later on in life. However, when he did become a Muslim, he became such a devoted believer in this religion and such a loyal servant and partisan of the Holy Messenger of God that history tells us of an incident where the Prophet once asked for a glass of water for a drink. Amr ibn al-Hamiq was the one to immediately answer the Prophet's call. He went and he brought back with him a cup full of milk. He handed it over to the Prophet of Islam and in return the Prophet made a prayer for Amr ibn al-Hamiq. He made a dua for him. What did the Prophet say? He said, Allahumma matta'ahu bi shababih. Oh Allah, make him fully enjoy his youth. Which is why historians say that until his dying days, when he was 80 years old, Amr ibn al Hamiq al Khuza'i did not have a single strand of gray hair to be found anywhere on his head or his face. 
In other words, this prayer of the Messenger of God, yet another prophetic miracle, was manifested in this manner. When the Prophet said, may he enjoy fully to its maximum extent, his youth, his entire life became youthful. A few other things that you should know about Amr ibn al-Hamiq is that when he embraced Islam, he embraced it wholeheartedly. Meaning that he became devoted to the Messenger of God as we said, but he didn't just stop there. He also became devoted to the one appointed by the Prophet as his successor, meaning Amir al-Mu'mineen, which means that he encapsulated Islam in its entirety. He didn't pick and choose. He didn't say, well, this area is, is convenient for me, so I'll take it. But this area is less convenient, so I will abandon it. Instead, he became a believer with no questions asked. In fact, we are told that it was in the Battle of Safin when he came to the, whole, the commander of the faithful, to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, and he addressed the Imam while everyone looked on and made a declaration of faith, perhaps so that other people are emboldened by the devotion of this great man. And perhaps he was simply articulating the motives for him joining the cause of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Listen to this. He said to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Inni wallahi ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. By God, O commander of the faithful, Ajabtuka wa la bayatuka ala qarabatin bayni wa baynak. I didn't answer your call or join you or give you my pledge of allegiance because there is any kinship between us. It's not because we are relatives. I am from one tribe, from Khuza'ah, and you are from another tribe. In other words, there's no physical commonality here. I didn't join you because I was hoping that you would give me from the riches of the earth. Because you promised to pay me. Because I stood to benefit financially to enrich myself by joining your mission. And not because I thought that I would join you so that I would become, I would assume some kind of a political position like all politicians. And so that I would be praised and I would be exalted and people would respect me. That's not why I did what I did. Rather, I loved you for five attributes that you and you alone possess. Number one, Because you are the cousin of the Prophet. And you were the first person to believe in the Prophet. You are the first Muslim. You are the husband of the mistress of the women of this nation, Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. You are also the father of the prophetic lineage that remind us of the Holy Prophet. You are also the one who has a proven track record in your struggle in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one has done more jihad than you. He came to the Imam, he expressed his insight as to why he chose Ali ibn Abi Talib, because of his virtues, because of his merits. He's not looking for money. He's not looking for fame. He's not looking to benefit in any way, shape or form. In fact, we know that unlike other leaders, unlike other rulers, to join Ali ibn Abi Talib means that you will have to pay a hefty price. Not only will you not personally benefit in this dunya, in this world, 
But to be a Shia was and continues to be a reason to suffer. You will have to be tested. You will have to be tried. You're not, gonna going, you're not going to get anything out of it. In fact, you will lose much simply by aligning with Ali ibn Abi Talib. But that is the right thing to do. And only those who are righteous will do so. One of the reasons there isn't much about Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i and historians have not spoken of him a great deal. And in fact, we can argue that there is a deliberate attempt to cover up the life and legacy of this great companion of the Holy Prophet is because Amr ibn al-Hamiq was one of the personalities, one of the leading opposition figures to the Khilafah of Uthman ibn Affan. And so of course, as we know, history is written by the victors. History is recorded by the kings and by the monarchs and by the rulers. And so the rulers didn't quiet favor someone who was considered a leading opposition figure against the Khilafah of the third Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan. Why did he oppose Uthman the way he did so vociferously? The answer is quite simple. Anyone who reads through the history of Uthman will find that there were mind-boggling violations of the religion of God throughout his tenure, throughout his term as the Khalifa until he was killed. Uthman, as the commander of the faithful, described him in his famous Fadaki, in his Shakshaqiya sermon. The Imam describes him like this, and I don't want to go into details or describe this, but the Imam simply says, بَيْنَ نَثِيلِهِ وَمُعْتَلَفِهِ This was a man who was interested in nothing more than pleasing his carnal desires. He was interested in enjoying himself, in eating the most flavorsome foods, in having the best time in his life that he could possibly have. And as a result of that, uh, Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i was uh, very vocal in his opposition against him. Not only this, but historians actually go as far as to say that Amr ibn al-Hamiq was among the chief killers of Uthman. In other words, he is considered the murderer of the Khalifa. So you can understand why now he was not looked at favorably by historians. Of course, this is a lie. It's not true. Yes, he was very vocally opposed to Uthman. Yes, he was an opposition figure. Yes, he was one of the people who spoke out openly about the corruption and about the uh, terrible uh, means with which Muawiyah, with which Uthman ruled over the Muslim nation. Uh, he was very vocal about this, but that doesn't mean just because you're opposed to someone that you would kill them. Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i, we know for a fact, did not kill Uthman. But let me ask you a question. Let's say Amr ibn al-Hamiq did participate in the killing of Uthman. Why is that such a big deal? Why is that so bad? Don't the mainstream Sunnis, and in particular the Wahhabi school, don't they believe that the companions of the Prophet are all righteous? Don't they argue very strongly, I might add, that the companions of the Messenger of God are good people? Don't they say that if the companions committed a sin, that sin will be forgiven by God because they are destined to go to heaven? 
Don't they claim that the verse in the Quran, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا That if two groups of believers fought against each other, you should try and reconcile between them. Which basically means, and they're making this case, that ultimately they remain good people. They remain believers in God. You should try and reconcile between them. So let's say for argument's sake that Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i murdered Uthman ibn Affan. So what? They are, as we uh, commonly hear, they are like your parents. If your parents fight each other, you're, you shouldn't take sides. You should try and reconcile between them. And so how about we just say that they will meet God and they will be reconciled in the presence of God on the day of judgment and that would be the end of the story. Why is it that we have these double standards? If Muawiyah kills a companion, then he has every right to do so. If Uthman kills a companion, as he did to Abu Dharr al-Ghifari, this incredibly righteous companion of Rasulullah, Abu Dharr, who doesn't know Abu Dharr? Uthman forced him into exile. And he starved to death. But that is perfectly fine. Uthman is still a righteous companion to be praised and to be commended, even though he engaged in a blatant act of murder. But when it comes to Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i, if he is the one, another companion, as we said, if he kills another companion, then he has to be condemned. So what if he killed Uthman? But as I said earlier, he never participated in the killing of Uthman. But he was opposed to him. Why was he opposed? For example, and this is something that historians uh, state, and there's no dispute over this. Uthman, as soon as he assumed the Khilafah, he began to engage in some of the most blatant and shameless favoritism and nepotism with his tribe, Bani Umayyah, with his family, with his relatives. For example, he sent Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Sarh, who was his half-brother. He sent him to Egypt and he appointed him as the governor of Egypt. And he told him that you can take Kharaj Misr, you can take all the taxes of Egypt to yourself, it's your own personal property, Allahu Akbar. Not only this, but this man, Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Sarh, was one of the people who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa in his lifetime, had said, you can find him and kill him wherever you find him. In other words, he was Mahdur al-Dam. The Prophet said, you can kill him. The Prophet condemned him. The Prophet threw him out. And yet, Uthman conveniently brought him back. And not only did he do that, but he gave him the governorship of Egypt, this big, powerful country. That is one example of the rampant corruption in the time of Uthman. What else? Marwar ibn al-Hakam, who was also Tarid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He was also thrown out of the city of Medina by the Holy Prophet. Uthman brought him back. And he gave him khums of all the taxes from Africa. Subhanallah. They tell us that khums is not a part of Islam. That khums is a, an innovation, even though it's right there in the Quran. But when Uthman gives khums of all the taxes collected from the continent of Africa to his friend Marwan ibn al-Hakam, al-Wazagh ibn al-Wazagh, the lizard that the Prophet threw out, that is perfectly fine. And so add these corrupt actions and add these crimes and add all of these things to the long list of crimes committed by Uthman to the fact that he caused the death of Abu Dharr and others and others like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, for example, this famous reciter of the Quran, he was beaten in the mosque of Rasulullah 
in broad daylight. They stepped over his stomach by the order of Uthman. Changing religious rules, for example, wudu, which was taught by the Holy Prophet How is wudu? How do we know wudu? For all of us, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, wudu is very simple. Ghaslatan wa mashatan. It is two washes and two wipes. This is how the Prophet taught uh, wudu. Uthman came and he changed it and it turned into this elaborate ritual which has no resemblance to what the Prophet did. The favoritism, the nepotism, the corruption, and on and on and on. Amr ibn al Hamiq al Khuza'i could not stay silent. So he rose and he spoke out against Uthman. In fact, things got so bad that even Aisha, a Tabari, who's a Sunni historian, narrates this in his tarikh. They say that after Uthman did all the things that he did, including cutting off the monthly stipend that was given to Aisha and the wives of the Prophet, which was doubled and tripled under the second Khalifa, uh, due to a system that he devised, a system that he created, hierarchies and caste system, where certain people would get more than others. For example, Arabs were favored, non-Arabs were thrown out. This is all under the second Khalifa. When Uthman came, Uthman said, you know what? The wives of the Prophet, specifically, his beef with, was with Aisha. He said, you're no longer receiving the monthly stipend that you used to get. So Aisha, then came out and she said the following statement. Again, Tabari narrates this. She said, faqad kafar. Kill Na'thal for he has become a kafir. Who is Na'thal? Na'thal was a Jewish man uh, back in the time of the Prophet. And so Aisha here is likening Uthman to Na'thal and saying that he is a kafir, he must be killed. Of course, as soon as Uthman was killed and unexpectedly to Aisha at least, the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib was now given the pledge of allegiance to be the next Khalifa. So Aisha decided to switch strategies and this time said, لا أبالي أن تقع السماء على الأرض. I wish the heavens would fall onto the earth. قتل والله مظلوما. Uthman was killed while he was oppressed and I will be the one to seek his vengeance for him. So who are they going to seek vengeance from? Who are they going to point the fingers at? Who are they going to attack now under the guise and pretext of the killing of Uthman? It is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Hence the battle of the Jamal. Hence the battle of Safin and the battle of Nahrawan and all of the things that occurred later on because they accused Amirul Mu'mineen of harboring the killers of Uthman. Who were the killers of Uthman according to this narrative, according to this concoction, according to this lie? Chief among them was Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i. Even though we know that the group that killed Uthman wasn't those from Medina. It wasn't the inner circle of Amir al muminin Imam Ali. It was in fact a delegation that had come from Egypt. It was the Egyptians who killed Uthman. And specifically it was a man by the name of Kanana ibn Bishr al-Tajibi or al-Tujibi. This man who was an Egyptian who was fed up with the governor that Uthman had appointed, his half-brother, as I said earlier, he came and he was the one who killed him. But of course, they're going to blame Amir al muminin because they want to remove him. He is the ultimate target. Let's not forget. Now, Amr ibn al-Hamiq was a solid supporter and disciple of Amir al muminin which is why I want you to listen very carefully to his words I mentioned when he approached Amir al muminin in the Battle of Safin and he told him that I didn't join you because uh, I stand to benefit from this. After that, he made the following statement. He said, فَلَوْ أَنِّي كُلِّفْتُ نَقْلَ الْجِبَالِ الرَّوَاسِي 
O commander of the faithful, if I were commanded to remove these rugged mountains, solid mountains, from one place to another, rock by rock, I wouldn't hesitate. Oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, if you asked me to scoop out an entire ocean, cup by cup, I would not hesitate. I would do so. Allahu Akbar. Brothers and sisters, this is the kind of loyalty that gives you immortality. This is the kind of devotion that makes you a person whose praises are sung for thousands of years. This is what makes you among the disciples of Ali. This is what makes you among the supporters of the Imam of your time. <coughs> we all say, Allahumma ajjil li waliyik al faraj. O oh Allah, hasten the return of your servant. Waj'alna min awliya'ihi wa asfiya'ihi. O oh Allah, make us among his partisans, his supporters, his backers, his helpers, his disciples. But this is what it takes. If you asked me to scoop out an ocean, cup by cup, I wouldn't hesitate. And I would do so, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Allahu Akbar. In this day and age, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves losing our faith by the merest of challenges. The simplest comment, somebody says something and the sister takes off the hijab. One person sends a positive comment and all of a sudden you have a brother doing things that are not befitting the status of a Shia, the status of a believer on social media. Why are we so weak? Why are we so meek? Why do we lose our faith in exchange for nothing? Why do we sell so cheap? This is Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuzai. Then he said to the Imam, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I would do this to support any of your supporters. Wa bihi aduwak, And I shall do so to humiliate and defeat your enemy. مَا رَأَيْتُ أَنِّي قَدْ أَدَّيْتُ فِيهِ كُلَّ الَّذِي يَحِقُّ عَلَيَّ مِنْ حَقِّكَ He said, even after I do all of that, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, I still wouldn't think that I have fulfilled your right upon me. So Amir al-Mu'mineen responded to him. He said, Allahumma nawwir qalbahu bittuqa. Oh Allah, illuminate his heart with piety. وَهْدِهِ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Guide him to the straight path. Layta. This statement sums it up. This is the icing on the cake. Allahu Akbar. The Imam then said, Layta أَنَّ فِي جُنْدِي مِئَةٌ مثلك. I wish, أو مئتن, I wish that I had a hundred people like you. O Amr. A hundred people like you. And... Ali's rights would never be usurped. May Allah make us among those who are devoted to the service of our Imam. Who cares if we lose the battle, if we end up becoming triumphant as Allah promised the disciples of Jesus? Who cares if people mock us, if we know that we are connected to the Imam of our time. Who cares if people speak ill of us online, offline? Does it even matter? Are these things even worth our consideration, our time? We follow the Ahlul Bayt because they are the path to Allah. As we recite in Ziyaratul Jami'ah towards the end, اللهم إني لو وجدت شفعاء أقرب إليك من محمد وأهل بيته الأخيار الأئمة الأبرار لجعلتهم شفعائي إليك. Oh Allah, if there was anyone, if there was, if if I could find anyone who would intercede for me toward you, who was closer to you than Muhammad and his immaculate family, his noble progeny, then I would. Use them to get to you. 
But I know, O oh Allah, that's basically what we're trying to say. We know that there is no one better, more noble, more righteous, greater than the family of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. That's why we follow them. We don't care about anything else. So this was Amr ibn al-Hamq al-Khuza'i. And this is in fact why Amir al-Mu'mineen one day told him about what's going to happen to him. Because when you reach a certain level, when you reach a certain station, the divine guides lift the veils so that you could see the truth as it really was. That's what Imam al Hussein did to his companions on the eve of Ashura. This is what Imam Ali said to uh, Amr ibn al Hamiq al Khuza'i. He also said something similar to that to Maytham al Tammar. What did he say to Amr ibn al Hamiq? He said to him, You will verily get killed and your head will be carried. Now, this was about 12, 13 years before the martyrdom of Amr ibn al Hamiq. Salamullahi alayhi. Now, after the martyrdom of the commander of the faithful, Amr became one of the staunchest defenders of Imam al Hassan. But after Muawiyah poisoned Imam al Hassan and killed him, he then began to hunt down the companions of Imam al Hassan and Imam Ali. And so he went after them one by one, despite the fact, remember, that Imam al Hassan had signed a truce with Muawiyah, one of the clauses of that truce was that Muawiyah would not hunt down, he wouldn't trace and go after the companions of Imam al Hassan. But of course we know Muawiyah violated that clause the way he violated every other clause. And the way he uh, transgressed every single moral commitment that exists. Because that is Muawiyah. And we know uh, that he is no better than this. Imam al Hussein, in fact, describes the killing of Amr ibn al Hamiq in a letter he wrote to Muawiyah. In that letter, Imam al Hussein basically fed Muawiyah to the shredders. He fed him to the pigs, I should say. And he mopped the floor with him. He listed some of his greatest crimes, one of which was this. He said to him, Amr ibn al -hamiq. Are you not the one who killed Amr ibn al Hamiq, Sahib Rasulullah, who was a companion of the Messenger of God? So, in other words, Imam al Hussein, first of all, uh, he highlights the fact that Amr was a companion of the Prophet. Number two, he said, Al Abd al Salih al Ladi Ablatu al Ibadah. He was this righteous slave of God who would worship so much that he was exhausted from worship. He was so frail and weak and his face was discolored. He looked yellow from all of the worship that he engaged in day and night. And this is after you gave him immunity. You gave him assurances such that مَا لَوْ أَعْطَيْتَهُ طَائِرًا لَنَزَلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَأْسِ الْجَبَلِ Had you given those assurances to a bird that was flying in the air, the bird would come down to you. In other words, you gave him so many assurances and yet you betrayed him, you turned around and you murdered him. ثُمَّ قَتَلْتَهُ جُرْعَةً عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ The audacity that you displayed against your God by killing him was تِخْفَافًا بِذَلِكَ العهد. These are the words of Imam Al-Husayn to, al to Muawiyah about Amr ibn Al-Hamiq and his murder. So, how was Amr killed? Very briefly. When Imam al Hassan was murdered, as we said by Muawiyah, Amr realized that Muawiyah was going to go after the companions of Imam al Hassan. And so the first thing he did was he went to a city on the outskirts of Mosul, which is the famous city in Iraq today. Uh, this village was called 
Shahrazur. He went there and he hid for a while um, and he basically sought refuge. One of, he wasn't alone. There was another person who joined him there. He was his servant by the name of Zahir ibn Umar al-Aslami. Now this person is important as I'll come to explain later. So at one point historians say Amr ibn al-Hamiq spoke to Zahir uh, al-Aslami and he told him that you should go, leave me. Because these people want me, they're not looking for you. Leave me. All I ask is that once I get killed, you don't let them leave my body on the ground. I want you to be the one to uh, bathe me and to enshroud me and to bury me. So this man who was his servant, as I said, Zahir al-Aslami, he told him, how could I abandon you? You are my master. You are my friend. I will never leave you alone. I will stay with you and fight to defend you to my final breath. But Amr ibn al-Hamiq insisted. He said, no, listen to me. Just leave me and look after me once I get killed. Perhaps there were two reasons for this. Reason number one, well, three, let's say. The most obvious is that he didn't want him killed. The second is Amr ibn al-Hamiq knew that he was going to be killed no matter what. Why? Because Amir al-Mu'mineen had told him fact that you will be killed. Number three, because Zahir al-Aslami became one of the companions of Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura. He was one of the martyrs in Karbala. And so perhaps Amr ibn al-Hamiq being this close protege and confidant of Amir al muminin he knew of this. And so he wanted Zahir to stay alive. And so Amr ibn al-Hamiq remained alone. As I said, Muawiyah then wrote to him. He gave him assurances. He said to him, come to Sham. You have nothing to worry about. All is forgiven. All is forgotten. Many people have come to Sham now. We're turning the page. You can come to me and you will be my guest. You will be a guest of honor and so on and so forth. All of these details are mentioned in history books. Muawiyah gave him all of these false assurances and lied to him as Imam al Hussein told Muawiyah. But of course, Amr knew the kind of filth that Muawiyah was. So he didn't trust him, not, a, not the least bit. So he didn't go. But what happened after, again, shows you just what a vile creature Muawiyah was. What did he do to put pressure on Amr ibn al-Hamiq? He arrested his wife. Allahu Akbar. He arrested his wife whose name was Amina bint Shuraid, and he had her transported all the way to Sham. From where? From Medina or perhaps Kufa in Iraq to Sham. This, by the way, I will mention parenthetically that this is perhaps one of the reasons that Imam al Hussein took his women and children and family along with him when he went to Karbala. A question that's often asked why did Imam al Hussein take his entire family with him? Perhaps one of the reasons was that Bani Umayyah were known to use the dirtiest tactics of all, including taking the women and the children as hostages so that they can put pressure on individuals that they wanted to manipulate. And so Imam al Hussein would never want any harm to reach his women and children, number one. Number two, he didn't want them to be used as pawns by Yazid, the son of that Muawiyah, and force Imam al Hussein or force his companions to give their pledge of allegiance just to save the women and the children. So Muawiyah captures and arrests Amina bin Shuraid, and he sent a message to Amr ibn al-Hamiq in the most vile forms, and he told him that I will kill your wife unless you surrender to the governor that I've appointed to the city of Mosul. And so Amr ibn al-Hamiq had no choice now. He surrendered to the governor. He was at this time around 80 years old. There was no power left in him. 
there was no options available to him, so he simply surrendered to them. As soon as they captured him, they had orders from Muawiyah to behead him. فَقَتَلَهُ مُعَاوِيَةٌ ذَبَحَهُ وَقَطَعَ رَأْسَهُ When you hear ISIS and other terror groups slaughtering human beings, remember that Muawiyah was the one. Bani Umayyah were those who established this tradition. Those early hypocrites who claimed to be companions of Rasulullah, who claimed to be Muslims, that they were the ones who established this tradition. Giving someone assurances that they won't bring any harm to them, only to then take them and slaughter them? Allahu Akbar. Not only this, but Muawiyah then ordered his governor in Musul to take the severed head and send it all the way to Sham. Which made his head awwal ra'sin humila fil Islam. The first time that a severed head was transported from one place to another as a trophy, as a trophy to be celebrated, was the head of Amr ibn al Hamiq al Khuza'i, just as Amir al Mu'mineen had prophesied and told him would happen. So they transported his head to Sham. As soon as Muawiyah took the head of Amr ibn al Hamiq, he then said, Take this head to the prison. He said, throw it into the lap of his wife. Allahu Akbar. They say that when she took the head of her husband, Amr ibn al-Hamiq, this 80-year-old man, she put her head, her hand over her head, and she started to praise him and say how much he was devoted to God, how he was a companion of Rasulullah, how he spent his days in fasting, his nights in prayer. Then she said to the messenger of Muawiyah, the person, the prison guard who brought the head, she said, come, come, come. I want you to go and deliver my message to Muawiyah. wa minka ahlak wala ghafara laka dhambak. Allahu Akbar, this valiant Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib was known for her articulate nature. The way she spoke, even in the midst of this tragedy, she's grieving over her husband. And this is how she speaks. She said, go to tell Muawiyah, may your children be orphaned and may your women be deprived of you, your family be deprived of you, and may God never forgive your sin. فَرَجِعَ Rasul, This messenger went back to Muawiyah and he told him what this woman had said. So Muawiyah sent after her, they brought her to him. He told her, أَأَنْتِيَا عَدُوَّةَ اللَّهِ صَاحِبَةَ الْكَلَامِ الَّذِي بَلَغَنِي بِهِ You, O enemy of God, are you the one who said these things about me? And so in response, she said, Naam, غَيْرُ مُنَازِعَةٍ عَنْ Yes, it was me who said those things. And don't think that I'm retracting any of those words. I am not denying any of them. وَلَا مُعْتَذِرَةً مِّنْ I am not apologizing for any of the things that I said. وَلَا مُنْكِرَةً لَهُ And I will never deny it. There was a, a verbal confrontation between her and Muawiyah. The courage that she had was astounding. At the end, Muawiyah uh, told her, Ukhruji min biladi, leave my city, leave my nation. I don't want to see you. She said, Af'alu Allah, ma huwa li bi watan. Of course I will leave this place. This isn't my home. But subhanAllah, Muawiyah then ordered her to be given poison. Muawiyah, by the way, was famous for saying, Inna lillahi junudam min asal. He poisoned Imam al Hassan to death. He poisoned Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr to death. He poisoned uh, Malik al Ashtar to death. He poisoned so many people. And uh, this woman became just one of his other victims. The wife of Amr ibn Hamak al Khuza'i was also poisoned. And on her way back, she was headed towards Hems in Syria. That is when the poison took hold of her body and killed her. 
making her a martyr just like her husband. <laughs> Allah, man.